be here and good morning. I'm Osvaldo from Canada and today I want to present a, a, a work that aims to compare a cow site diagnosis techniques for subclinical metritis in dairy cows. So the presentation overview is very simple. Uh, I saw a lot of confusion in the diagnosis of postpartum uterine disease. So I will give a brief explanation about, about that. And then I will just simply explain the materials and methods. This is a very practical and simple study. And yes, we, uh, later on we can re discuss the results and the conclusion. So the main risk factor associated with postpartum uterine disease, it of course is of course the parturition because the genital tract is open and uh, the cow is having a metabolic change from not producing any milk to produce a lot of milk. So uh, it is normal to have at the beginning of the postpartum uh, bacterial contamination, yeah? But if we have a strong um, uh, immune response, an inflammatory response, the cow is gonna be healthy and she's not gonna be de develop the postpartum uterine disease. But uh, when they, we have a decrease or a, uh, a decrease immune function or a dysregulation of the inflammation in the endometrium, this bacterial contamination is gonna turn on to a bacterial infection. And then we're gonna have postpartum uterine disease. So when we are talking about postpartum uterine disease uh, in a chronological order, first we have to define what is metritis. So metritis is the red-brown discharge uh, coming from the uterus within 21 days in milk, but always important to say systemic signs, fever or decreased uh, feed intake, yeah? So when you have, it's normal to have discharge, but only is defined as metritis when you have uh, systemic signs. After that, or after 21 days in milk, you can have other type of uh, disease. You can have endometritis, you can have endometritis and purulent vaginal discharge, that is not called clinical endometritis, or you can have combination between different diseases. And if this inflammation persists after the insemination, uh, we're gonna have a decreased conception rate. So what is the difference between endometritis and PVD? So when we are diagnosed, uh, the purulent discharge via vaginal scope, metric check, or the glob hand method, we are looking for the gross inflammation of the uterus coming uh, uh, mainly collected at the fornix of the vagina. But we don't know if this purulent discharge is only from vaginitis, from cervicitis, from endometritis, or the combination of this different uh, inflammatory process. So for example, where we are taking the metric check, we see this chart and we don't say that it's clinical metritis. We say that it's purulent vaginal discharge because we don't know from which exact part of the uh, genital tract is coming this inflammation. And there is a poor agreement with, between the purulent vaginal discharge and the endometrial cytology. So uh, that's why uh, we, we could prove already that it's not the same disease. Okay, to diagnose endometritis, first we have to define what is the inflammation uh, of, of the uterus that we have. So when we cut the, uh, the uterus uh, layers in different parts, we have the endometrial, uh, the endometrium that is the more superficial part, myometrium and perimetrium. If we, see, if we see this in a picture, we see that the endometrium has two parts, the stratum compactum, that is the superficial part, and the stratum spongiosum. So when we are talking about endometritis or mainly subclinical endometritis, we are talking about the presence of polymorphonuclear cells in the superficial endometrium being the uh, stratum compactum. So how to diagnose endometritis? So Takeshi was showing already something very similar. I didn't steal it from, from him, I created by myself also. So there are uh, you mainly have three techniques to diagnose endometritis. Histology, cytology, and ultrasound. So there is not a perfect technique. Each technique has advantages and disadvantages. So probably the histology is the best way to diagnose the inflammation of the endometrium because we can see all the cells in the different layers. So we can see all the inflammatory cells through the different layers. But it's invasive and it's time consuming and it's expensive. Ultrasound is very simple. Uh, you don't need any, uh, you need some training, but you can diagnose like behind the cow. You can have the result very fast but that's the correlation between uh, the cytology and the ultrasound, it is not good. So cytology is not the best technique to diagnose endometritis, but probably is the, it's an equilibrium between the practical point of view and the sensitivity of the test. So yeah, 
uh, when we diagnose uh, subclinical metritis by cytology, we are talking then about cytological metritis. So by definition, cytological metritis is the presence of polymorphonuclear cells in the superficial endometrium without the absence of any clinical sign and uh, very importantly, uh, with a reduction of the reproductive performance of the cow. So how to diagnose? Yeah, uh, I'm very fond also of the cytobrush, but in different parts of the world, they're using different techniques. They're using the cytobrush or they're using the lavage. So in the cytobrush, it's, it's very simple. It's like an insemination. So like uh, Harold was explaining, you have to pass the cervix, collect the sample, and roll the sample on a slide. And then you have the cytology sample. The lavage, in my point of view, is a bit more difficult because you have to infuse some liquid in the lumen of the uterus, then you have to collect back this liquid. And when you collect back, then you have to go to the lab, centrifuge the sample, and then you will have a pellet, and then you put the, the smear on the slide. In, in both cases, where after you, you, you have the sample on the slide, you have to stain and you have to count the polymorphonuclear proportions versus the uh, epithelial cells. Okay, this is the problem of the cytobrush. So you're taking the sample at the farm, and in most of the cases, you're already at the farm, and you want to treat the cow. But if you are taking a cytology, you still have to go to the lab, you have to stain the sample, you have to check in the microscope, so you are not anymore at the farm to treat the cow. That's why this uh, experiment is just try to facilitate this technique and compare cow site techniques to avoid the cytology use. Um, yeah, many people around the world already use the leukocyte serous strip to, die, to, to check the presence of granulocytes in the sample. And this technique is very simple because at the farm, you can already have the liquid sample by putting the cytobrush in a 1 ml in an appender tube or by the lavage. You put directly the strip and then you can read the strip like at the farm and you have a different classification of the staining intensity. And then, based on different cutoff points, you can say already that the cow has subclinical emetritis in this case. Um, some people around the world, there are, I think, three or four papers, uh, papers working on that already. So, uh, Koto, uh, Jose, and also Cheong from Cornell, they were working in different cutoff points using different techniques to assess uh, endometritis uh, in cows. But the problem is that different people around the world use different techniques, like the flashing or the cytobrush, and they use different cutoff points with different sensitivities and specificities. So we want to compare these different cutoff points and different techniques to try to standardize the, the method. And on the other hand, uh, we have a BRICS refractometer at the, at the university, and like many practitioners have this BRICS refractometer, uh, to measure the total protein in colostrum and to, uh, to assess the quality of colostrum. And we also have the theory that if we, have, if we probably have more uh, content of solid in the sample, it is associated with a higher PMN count in the sample. So also we are trying this technique at the same time. Yeah, it's portable and it's very easy to use. So objectives, I already say. So it's to compare the cytobrush versus the lavage uh, cytological outcomes and to compare these outcomes with the cow side test, being the leukocyte steras and the breeze refractometry. So um, in a normal Canadian farm, the meat production was 11,000 kilo per lactation. We used 248 cows, and we did a sample size calculation based in a previous study also in Canada, where they found a kappa, uh, kappa agreement between cytology and leukocyte steras of for, uh, 0.43% and expecting a prevalence of 30% of the disease with a 95 confidence interval and 80% 80, 80 of power. And we, we uh, visit the farm once per week, so between 21 or, and 35 days in milk. So we prepare all the material in advance, so when we were at the farm, it was everything ready to don't lose any time. First, we did a metric check. We evaluated the, the discharge of the cow. And then we took cytobrush samples. We have it like this, and we did the, everything at the farm, also this one, so it's the local size for us, uh, outcome. And at the farm also, we measured the BRICS refractometer. So this, for example, one sample was 1.3.
Uh, I will try to simplify this because it's a bit complicated. For the cutoff point for PVD, it's already standard. It's uh, between 21, uh, 29 to 35 days in milk. So the cutoff point for PVD was muku porulent by analyst charge or worse. With the local size strips, we play with the cutoff point that different authors already use. We use one and two or worse. Uh, the, also, the PMM percentage uh, 21 to 35 days in milk is pretty standard based on previous study. It's 5% of PMNs. And to correlate and associate these samples, we use concordance correlation coefficient analysis for continuous variables and for categorical values, kappa agreement, sensitivity, and specificity. So the simple part, descriptive statistics. Yeah, the PMM percentage was higher in, in, in lavage samples versus the cytobrash. This is because when you're doing the flashing, you collect a higher surface of the endometrium. And when, when you put this sample in the centrifuge, you are concentrating the number of PMNs and you will have a higher number of PMNs in the sample. It's quite logical. Uh, when we're talking, this is very complicated. I will try to simplify. So we evaluate also the effective sampling. So what is effective sampling? So I have a cow, I want to do cytology. So when they're using a cytobrush, the main problem of doing cytology in, the, in this cow is to pass the cervix. Some cow, they have a twisted cervix or it's difficult to pass. In our case, we pass in 95% of the cases the cervix. And out of the sample that we have in 95% of the cervix pass, we could read most of the sample. So this, we could pass the sample and the sample was readable. Yeah? But when you're doing the, cytolo the cytology diagnosis by the lavage, you have to pass the cervix, you have to put the liquid, you have to collect the liquid. For me, in my case, it was not that easy to collect the liquid all of the time, so the effective sampling by this technique was, was lower, was 85%. And the prevalence, uh, yeah, so the lower prevalence of the, in this case of vaginalis chart was only 9% because you're evaluating the gross infection or the gross inflammatory response of the cow. But when we're using different techniques, uh, we increased the, the prevalence of the disease, and the higher prevalence was also in the cytology of the, uh, of the lavage than in cytology of the cytobrush. I cannot talk in detail now, but then you can read the paper and you can, you can see. So similarly than other experiments, so the association between the vaginal discharge and the cytology was very poor, was very low, but the sensitivity was high. So it means that when a sample was positive to, to the uh, cytobrush, was very likely to be positive also in the vaginal discharge. And we found a better uh, kappa agreement was not good, was just moderate uh, between the cytobrush cytology and the cutoff, cutoff point two. So probably if you are taking a sample between 29 to 35 days in milk, it is better to use a cutoff point of two instead of one for the local size cytobrush. And it's uh, the agreement between the lavage and the cytobrush technique using the local side was also moderate. It's not a perfect technique, but it's something that you can do at the farm. When we do the concordance correlation coefficient analysis, these are some passive bablock regression graphs. We saw that the uh, correlation between the polymorphonuclear cells in the cytobrush and lavage was uh, good or moderate to good. But when we compare the brisk index of both techniques was, was poor. And also at the same time, the, the association between the number of polymorphonuclear cells and the BRICS index was very bad. So probably is not a good technique, the BRICS index to diagnose subclinical metritis at the cow site. So conclusion, very fast and very easy. So yes, yeah, cytobrast and lavage, they yield similar results when comparing to each other. But in the lavage, you have a higher amount of polymorphonuclear cells. The local size strips are, is, is not a perfect technique, but uh, it's a reasonable uh, technique to diagnose endometritis with a fair accuracy. And the breast refractometer is not a good method to diagnose subclinical endometritis. And the main important thing is you can diagnose subclinical endometritis at a cow site, you can immediately treat the cow. So that is the advantage of, of, of this method. So I finished, so you have some questions, I will try to answer. And you can read the paper in detail, it's already published like two weeks ago.